So um, today's shear, which is we've just finished completed Parsha Shmos, we've got Parsha Shvaira, is entitled um, uh, the the balance. The, oh, Rachamim, which is Din, and Din, which is Rachamim. Understanding the Midos of Hashem in their complex interaction, as was explained to Moshe. How the Midos of Hashem really work. We got a major, major revelation of that by the events of last week's Parsha at the very end and the very beginning of this week's Parsha as we introduce the, as we introduce the, uh, the Makos. So, but I want to say that, that this year is dedicated to the memory of one, of one great Sadiq, two great Sadiqim, but particularly the Abir Yaakov, or Yaakov ben Masud, who died in 1880. He was the tenth generation of the original Abu Chatzera, who goes back to the 15th century. It was a tzaddik that saved Yerushalayim, the Jews of Yerushalayim, back in the 15th century, 16th century, and then migrated to Damascus, and then later to uh, Morocco. And as the legend goes, he didn't have a way to get there, so he used his mat because the boat wouldn't take him. So he put his mat on the water and just, you know, started chugging away until the people on the boat said, there's a rabbi out there on a mat. And they pulled him in. Needless to say, the rest of the journey was in record time. And because he has that legend, Rabbi Shmuel, the 10th generation ancestor of the Bir, Bir Yaakov, the 12th generation ancestor of the Baba Sali, who resided here in Eretz Yisrael and uh, passed away about 30 years ago, I believe in 1984, the same time Moshe Feinstein passed away, by the way. And he, um, for called Abi Chatzira, Avi meaning the father of the mat, because <laughs> he could use that mat for m miraculous things. You know, it's like they used to have. Way back when, when they sold things on TV, do they still have that, right? They sell you stuff on TV. You used to have, like, you know, these wonder things. You could do ten different things with it at once. Here's a mat. You can use it to sit on. You can use it as a window cover. You can use it as a boat. It's highly effective, but only if you're him. So, so we're going to hear some of the legends of the Abu Chatzera dynasty, particularly of the founder, Rabbi Shmuel, and of his great descendant, the 10th generation, Abir Yaakov, Yaakov ben Masud, who was the rabbi of all Maghreb, all the North African Jews, and he still um, is a major figure today, as through his grandson, the Baba Sali, who was well known in Israel, and through the Abu Chatzera dynasty, which has continued uh, into our day. And uh, the Abir Yaakov Yeshiva currently resides in Nahariya in northern Israel, which is very interesting. I'll explain why they were there. They were also, his son was, the, uh, uh, another Abu Chatzir dynasty was in Ashdod, another one in Etivot. Interesting. You know what all those cities have in common? They're on the border. They're like Shmirah. They right interfaced with the enemies of the Jewish people, right? Very close to Gaza, Gaza and Egypt, right? And actually, Abir Yaakov is buried in Dinamur, Egypt, and we'll tell that whole story, okay? That's a remarkable story, but you're going to have to be patient because we have to start with the Parsha, and we'll, be, we'll lead us right there on the mat. On the mat. <laughs> We're going to wade right into it. So here we go. It's also yours today of Rav Yisrael Dov of Vlednik, who was a great tzaddik who... Um, from the Square Dynasty, who was buried in North in, U in Ukraine. And uh, he said that anybody comes to my, my kever and touches the handle of my door, entering the, the Tzion, he um, will have a Yeshua. And I was privileged to touch that door on more than one occasion. And uh, it's a great place to go if you have a lot of money and a lot of time. <laughs> it's worth it. OK, here we go. So what happened at the very end of last week's Parsha deserves examination from a number of ways. What happened was, is that Moshe got a clear shlichut 
he got Simanim, he got the three signs, and he went to deliver them to the Zekene Yisrael. And their very straightforward mission was to go and tell Paro, show them the signs, and ask for a very simple thing, not to ask to free the Jewish people in total, but just to give them an opportunity to spend three day, a three-day vacation, you know? It's like a union negotiating for better terms, Lahavdo, you know? Three-day vacation. What could be so bad? They'll come back invigorated, enriched. And it would have made a lot of sense for Paro to grant it to them. So what went wrong? It went terribly wrong. When Moshe and Aaron set out with the Zakanim, what happens to the Zakanim? All 70 of them, assuming that there were 70. Yeah, there were 70. They all ran and hid because they were afraid to enter the palace of Paro, which is understandable according to the Medrash because he had like live lions ready to devour people at the entrance and who knows what sort of witchcraft and sorcery and wasn't exactly a safe place to travel, especially at night. But, uh, but you know, they left Moshe and Aaron. So in that sense, they failed the test. And as we'll see in one moment, Moshe also received a large rebuke for the event surrounding that incident. A very serious rebuke. But um, they don't show up. So Moshe and Aaron are forced to go by themselves, as it says. And they say two things to Paro. Bo Moshe, Bo Moshe va'aron, no zekenim, va'yomor el Paro, ko amar Adonai Elohei Yisrael. Notice the double name. Yudke vavke, and Elohim. Together. Shalach et ami ve'echoguli ve'midbar. Here, they put Yud Kei Vav Kei first. And what's very important to know, everybody knows, what's the difference between those two midot of Akash Baruch Hu? Yud Kei Vav Kei designates what? Rachamim. Rachamim, compassion, mercy. And Elohim is mastery, lordship, where there is... Um, for lack of a better term, we invoke this a lot during Yom and Narayim. One is the relationship between father and son, right? Love. And one is the relationship between a lord and their servants, and those that serve them. Two different midos. Comes Moshe Rabbeinu and introduces to Paro a very interesting thing. You might think that there's only Elohim. They're, they're very used to Elohims in the world. You know, Elohims were very common. Right? You did Every Avodah Zarah, like the Mishnah says in, uh, in Sanhedrin, has a certain set of rules. You give, you get. All right? You do your job, you get paid. You bring the carbon, you get the answer. It's very quid pro quo. It's the relationship between a master and a servant, an employer and employee. That was very common in the entire Avodah Zarah world. Now Moshe's coming and says, guess what? I want to introduce you, Paro, to a brand new concept. There's something called the father and son relationship. And guess what? The Jewish people are the sons of, of the, you know, the kindalach of Akash Baruch Hu. Wow, that is a radical concept, earth-shaking, to which Paro does not respond well. Because after all, if you're Paro, what do you think about that? Either we're the children of God, which, of course, what was the final maka? Makas b'choros, right? So, you know, Take any notion that this was the most favored nation, most favored nation of God. I made a bracha list. <laughs> Just in case we send this to Torah any time. How you doing, Torah, any time? I did make a bracha. Now, so that, that is an earth-shattering comment. And he says, guess what? Shalachet ami komar Hashem elokei Yisroel. Now, Yisrael means the aspect of all 12 tribes, which means not only are we serving a god, which again was very common. Anybody could serve any god. You didn't have to be from a certain nationality, right? You could serve whatever god you want. Here it says, no, no, no. There's something called a nation that serves this god and has a, a parent-child relationship, so to speak. And we all have to go. You know why? Because what do families do when they have time off? from work. They go out, yeah, they go away for Pesach to the hotel, 
right? We go to make a chag, a celebration. We're a family. And, you know, from time to time, we need a break from our work. And then we're going to go out with our family God, you know, our God of our family. And we're going to celebrate who we are and our unique relationship with God. Now, Paro, having never heard such a thing in his life, responds accordingly. Vayomer Paro, mi Hashem. What do you mean, never heard of Hashem? He didn't know those were Jewish people? He didn't hear of Avram Yitzhak and Yaakov? Of course he did. But he didn't understand this idea that there was now a nation, right? Okay, so Avram was a great guy and he had a great God. What does that have to do with me? Now you're telling me that things have evolved to a point of a nation of Bechor, B'ni Bechor Yisrael. Radical. I never heard of such a thing, he says. I share Shema Bechor. Why should I believe in such a thing? Yisrael. I'm in charge of Yisrael. Who's in charge of Yisrael? I'm in charge of Yisrael. He's, you know, so that right away shakes power up. You have no authority over my children. Who gave you authority over my children? He says, I never heard of such a thing. He says, I don't know who Hashem is. Vigames Yisrael lo ashaleach. They're mine and I will not them. Okay. Now, the Sukanian might have been, you know, able to do a little better job. After all, they're the workers. Did, did Levi work? No. Did Ruvain work? Prove to me that Ruvain didn't work. Who belonged to Ruvain that, that was in and out of the palace like the best friend? Dustin and Aviram. And, and who later comes with the Zakanim and pleads with Paro? The Zakanim are not those that are in the pits. They are the elite of the Jewish people, right? Who have no bondage. They're just leaders. That goes all the way back to the time of Yosef when he designated the tribe of Levi as priests, right? So you have three Shvatim. What's three Shvatim? Reuven, Shimon, and Levi. This is an idea from the Meshachachma that didn't work. And I'll even prove it to you. An amazing proof. It says when Moshe <clears throat> went out to travel to Mitzrayim, what happened there? Of course, we know the story. What happens to Moshe on the way back to Mitzrayim? He has a donkey to get to the hotel. He's got his two kids there. What happens? The snake comes and swallows Moshe, not once, but twice, from bottom up, top bottom, always stopping at the place of the, uh, you know, uh, uh, of the bris mila. As far figures out, it's got to be a bris mila problem. And what was the problem? That he delayed making the bris until they settled in a little bit. A minor, minor, seemingly infraction. And what does it say over there? It says that she does a bris. What was that baby called? There were two children. Gershom was already born. Gershom was born earlier. So whose bris was it? He's only eight days old. Eliezer. Thank you, Hashem, for saving me from the sword of Paro. One second. Which came first? Oh, by the way, what's Gershom? Ger Hayiti Be'eres Nochiyah. I was a stranger in a strange land. Which happened first to Moshe? Was he first saved from Paro's sword or first a stranger in a strange land? No, first he was saved from Paro, right? He had to escape Paro. Medr says that his, that his neck became as hard as a marble and they tried to slice his head off and it didn't work and he escaped. The Medr says all kinds of other explanations of exactly how, how Moshe got out. Moshe was saved and then he runs to Yisro. He runs to Midian. Okay? So, so why does he name his first kid? Eliezer. I was saved from the sword of Paro. Isn't that a great thing to name your kid? And then afterwards you could say, I'm stuck here, so ger hayisi veretz nechuyah, I was a stranger, but now I'm going to go to Mitzrayim and save the Jews. So, why was the names reversed? The answer is very simple. In the Pasuk itself, Moshe was told something. This is remarkable. On the way down, right at that point, when he was ready to stop to make the bris, right, what happens? Um, yeah, puts him on the chamor. It says like this. He goes to Yisro, he asks permission to go. Let me go. Let me see if they're still, you know, redeemable. So, Vayomer Yisro, Lemoshe, Leich Lishalom. Go, but make sure you're safe. Go Lishalom. 
meaning don't do anything dangerous. Now, why would it be dangerous for Moshe to go back to, power, go back to Mitzrayim at that point? Was the decree to kill him rescinded? No. You're walking back into it. Like, if you escape from a country in which you were tried and, and, uh, on a trial and a decreed a death penalty, are you going back to that same place and walking in the door of that courtroom? That's like the craziest thing to do. So Yisro was like, okay, you can go, but if you're doing anything dangerous, then don't take my daughter and uh, my, my two and new, newborn grandson into that problem. Are you, Moshe? So Hashem comes to Moshe and says an amazing thing. Don't worry, you don't have to stay in Midian anymore. Why? The people that wanted to kill you die. Who were those people that wanted to kill him? Two people. Who, who told the Lashon Hara about him? Rashi says, Mihem, Dasan, and Aviram. Did they really die? I mean, did they hang around for a long time, creating a lot of problems for Moshe, including the problem when they complained about the extra straw? You know, they, they're the first ones there to, to say uh, to Moshe, Yashu for uh, putting a cherev in the hands of power to kill us. So what do you mean they died? So Rashi says, Lo, lo chayim hayu, they were alive. They became poor. And somebody who's poor is considered like ki'ilu dead. They have no power. They have no influence. So one second. Where did they get, where did they get belongings for if they're slaves? How were they rich if they were slaves? Oh, they got poor. What do you mean they got poor? Every slave is poor. A poor owns nothing. They weren't. The answer is they were never slaves. They were very wealthy, aristocratic Jews. The Jews who were Nebuch working were those other Jews, not Ruvain, the firstborn tribe, not Shimon, right, the secondborn tribe, who also thought, you know, and Shimon and Levi thought they're so great, they don't need Yosef, they don't need anybody, right? And Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi were really the leaders of the Jewish people, were they not, from the time of the sale of Yosef? So who else is the Skanim? It must have been Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi. And guess what? They were... Um, afraid to accompany Moshe. And had they accompanied Moshe, what might have happened? What do you think would have happened? In walks Moshe and Aaron. They come with a pretty reasonable request, right? Although it's strange, you know, that you, you have a God. And the 70 elders from Ruvain, Shimon, and Levi, this is again according to the idea of the Meshach Hachma, that said, listen, we want to work, we're working hard, you know, and, and, and help us out here with a couple days rest, right? No. Had they come, maybe power would have said yes. But now it's Moshe of Aaron coming to start trouble without the samchut, without the accompaniment of the people who are really in charge of the Jews. So, so Moshe, says, La, Moshe says, he says to Moshe Aaron, Lama, why, why, are you, why are you being my free of the arm from Lech Lesivoscham? Get out of here. So who caused Paro to issue that edict against, against the Jews. Who really caused it? Well, the Moshe feels terrible and guilty, and Dawson and Aviram want to put blame on Moshe, but who really is to blame? The Shivim Skanim for not showing up and not backing Moshe and Aaron in their quest and leaving them hanging in the wind where, where, where power could brush them off like nothing. Whereas if you have the representatives of an entire nation of millions of people, maybe you talk to them. And by the way, they're punished, because what happens, and this is what here we get into the understanding of the subtleties between the name of Hashem and the name of Elohim, that they interact um, in a quantum fashion. What do I mean? You never know which one is which, and you never know where they are. What was the consequence? No straw, right? Very good. Who had to come and plead now? Who had to come to Paro? Who was forced to go to Paro to say, please, give us a break? The same 70 elders that didn't want to go with Moshe. They show up by Paro anyway. Look at the irony and the, the sense of humor, so to speak, of Hashem. It's not a sense of humor. It's just midah connected midah. You didn't want to go to Paro? You're going to end up crawling to Paro. Not with Moshe. Even though Moshe was going there to plead for you to have a break, now you're going to really have to plead and have a break. Gee, except on a lot different footing with a lot bigger consequences. By the way, it only lasted one day. That whole decree lasted one day. Because Paro was just trying to make a statement. He said, by Yoma, who? He said, on that day, you, I'm going to show you what slavery is. He was just trying to make a point. 
Some say it continued, but the Archaim HaKadosh says it never continued. E.g., so instead of going there and getting what you wanted, a nice little break and a Kesha with Hashem, oh, you're going to have this rebuke from Paro and a, lot of, and a very difficult day. You're not going to have any vacation. You're going to have overtime. You're going to have work. You have to work through the weekend. <laughs> so that's the, that's the idea. Now, was that a chesed from Hashem or a punishment from Hashem? What was it? So, on, in a sense, it was a chesed. How was it a chesed? Because that was the end for Paro. From that point forward, the very next day that Paro made that rash decree and rebelled against Hashem and the Jewish people fully, Mako Dam happened. And you know what happened with Mako Dam? All the work stopped. So they didn't need a three-day vacation anymore. They were permanently on vacation. Okay? And Hashem was really just setting up a circumstance by which the Shebud would be over. And this is what the Archaim says, which is a very complicated point. He says, Moshe complained to Hashem, if you're not ready to send the Jewish people out, why are you let me go to Paro so this all blows up in my face? Right? It's not the time. It's not the time. Send me when it's the time. It wasn't, apparently it wasn't the time, so why are you sending me? Archaim Kosh is an amazing thing. He says, that's why it says in the beginning of the parsha, Shmi Yudke Vavke Lonadati. I'm teaching you something about how Rachamim works. I couldn't, it wasn't the time for them to go. And according to the din, really, they should have stayed in slavery how many years? 400 full years. How much did they end up staying in, in there? 210, which, if you think about it, is a little bit more than half, right? And we have a principle in the Torah you go after the majority. Okay, it's good enough. You did more. You did. You did the most. You did, you did halfway, a little better than half. The Midat HaRachamim was operating against the Midat HaDin in such a powerful way, saying that even though there's a judgment, let's mitigate it. You understand? That's what's going on over here. Hashem couldn't help himself, so to speak, Kaviyocho, because these two Midos were, were bouncing against each other and interacting with each other while the din was needed to be enforced, and that was the will of Hashem, at the same time, Rachamim needed to be enforced, and that was the will of Hashem. How does that work? Is that something a human mind can comprehend? How do we understand that? It's too complicated. But, you know, on a, on a, on a small level, we do understand. Anybody who's a parent, right? Or a grandparent, for sure. Although I don't think grand grandparents count, because they're kulo Rachamim. They're kulo Rachamim. They spoil the kids rotten. But if you're a parent... You know, you want to lay down the law with a kid, teach them to obey properly, on the one hand. On the other hand, nebuch, my kid, how could I do anything to my child? And it's tough. Now, you leave them with someone else, they can get them into order right away. But when the parents come home, all the worst behavior. You drop them off at the friend's house, oh, they're such angels, <laughs> so respectful, so well-behaved. And they come home, ah! And, you, and you know, the parents want to run and bolt the door to the bedroom because the <laughs> monsters have arrived. I'm not saying anything bad about my kids. No, hospital. Uh, but I'm talking in theory, you know. Anyway, because parents have it so tough. They, want, they need to lay down a law. They need to teach the right thing. At the same time, they're overwhelmed with their own Rachmanus. And if they are overwhelmed by the Rachmanus, they're in big trouble because they end up giving the kids what they don't need, which is the blend of Yud Kevavke and Elohim. And that's Hashem, because that's the right thing. As we say, you know, um, the, um, the Yemin is Mikareves. Hashem takes you in mercy, but the left hand pushes a little bit, pushes back a little bit. Not everything comes without effort, without earning, without reward. That's how Hashem set the world, because it's a world of Bechira. Because Hashem pushes us back through the Midah of Bechira and says, you have to do it on your own, and you must earn it on your own. And that's where Moshe was revealed this mind-boggling idea, according to Rechem HaKadosh, that Hashem did the following. He said, I know they're not ready, but I sent you to Paro anyway because I couldn't help it. Because I wanted to end the Shebud early. So how did that end the Shebud? It did, because since it, it kind of boomeranged, where Hashem perhaps understood that the Shivim Skenim wouldn't go, and then it would have a reverse impact, or either way, it could have, it could have gone whichever way, whichever reaction Paro would have done, that was going to be the end of the Shebud. Hashem says it's got to be over now. 
12 months early. Do you know that it ended 12 months early? You know, by the time we got to Nissan, this was already, according to Lenny Meforshim, this was already ER, okay? Maybe Rosh Chodesh ER would have been the first plague, right? Because you go of 12 plagues, so this was Rosh Chodesh ER. And, and um, immediately, Makos Dam happened on the first day. So maybe it was two days Rosh Chodesh. And Moshe comes on the 29th of Nisan, you know, the, the, the 30th of Nisan. Next day is Rosh Chodesh. So that day, right, that they had the problem with the, was Erev Rosh Chodesh. And then the next day, which is Rosh Chodesh uh, ER, Makos Dam. And there's no three days. So the three days was only this thing. And they always had a, people have a philosophical problem with that. Why did he lie to Paro? You know, say the truth. It was, it was all about Midas Rachamim. It was to make, to give some normal Bechira to Paro. Normal Bechira. Give him a chance here. You tell him, okay, everybody's out, millions of people, goodbye. No one's going to allow that. Give him a three-day break. But you have to understand, it's because I'm in charge and I'm Elohim. That was a Bechira Paro had, and of course he blew it, and and the next thing we know, the Shebut is over. Twelve months before the... So, so if the Shebut is over, let's get out of here. Rosh Chodesh ER. Let's pack the bags and get out of here. No, because it's not quite over. First of all, a lot, a lot of things have to happen. The Jewish people have to be filled with emuna. They have to see wonders. They have to see miracles that are incontrovertible, that are clearly from Yudke Vovke, and, and not only from Elohim. We're going to get to that in the end. And through each plague, why, how? Because at the same time that Elohim is punishing Mitzrayim, what is he doing to the Jewish people? Raising up their level of Imuna and Ruchnias. Because they see the blood doesn't affect us. And you all the Midrashim, they would buy a pitcher of water, it turned into, a pitcher of blood, it turned into water. They would give it back to the, to the Mitzrayim, it would turn back into blood. Every Jew interacted with this miracle in such a profound and personal way that it boosted their emuna. In fact, that's what the Zohar says, that the lechem of, of the matzah was, was, a, was actually a medicine, ironically, because which great medicine of the modern era is, came from bread? Matzah is penicillin. Penicillin for the soul. What do you mean? Hashem is separating between me and the mitzri? You mean... I'm, as, I'm different than the Mitzri? How am I different than the Mitzri? I thought I was a Mitzri slave. I thought I'm nothing. I thought they're greater than me. I thought they have God on their side. I didn't even know there was a God anymore. Every Maka built the moon of Hashem. But at the same time, he didn't want them to work through it. This is the Chiddush of the Rechaim HaKadosh. The mercy and the din were all happening in a simultaneous, perfect mix. And therefore, when we look at our lives and you see things that are painful or hurtful, the worst thing you can do, the absolute worst thing you can do is run to Hashem and complain. How come this happened? How come? You know why? Because do you really know whether it's Rachamim or, or Din? You have no idea. You have no idea. It's like the person that you know, breaks their foot and misses the plane, and they're cursing, and I could have gone to the convention and the business deal, you know, and that's the plane that got blown up. You don't know. The story is not complete. And the way a Jew has to therefore approach, we learned in this week's parsha, is it is Rachamim. Everything is Rachamim. The Rachamim Kaddish says, Mi Hashem Yitzay HaTov. You know that song? Hashem only does good. Now, so where do you get all this Midas Adin from? Sometimes we make poor choices, like the Shivim Skanim, and they have to get it a different way. They were going to get the benefit, but they got it this way. They got a little patch to put them back on course. Was that a bad thing? It was one day. One day they had to run around and look for straw. Okay, bad things happen on that day. But in Begadol, it was a chesed. Because that little extra suffering finished the 210 years and the Midas HaRachamim said, stop! And guess who agreed with it? The Midas HaDin said, I accept it's enough. I hate to say it this way, but the miracle that we saw, and I believe it was a miracle with Rubashkin, you have to understand that simile in the same way. Like there was some sort of din in judgment against all of us. And somehow, when we reach that point of that Zos Hanukkah, right, that eight year, eight month, and eight days, 
eighth hour, 888, that's the Midah beyond this world. That's the Midah of Rachamim, pure Rachamim. The ore of Hanukkah, pure Rachamim, against all odds. The era, the, the ore of an open miracle. Because when, when Yudke Vavke is shining bright, then the world of Din means Teva and nature, because as we, as we know, nature is run the rules of nature, right? There are rules. That's it. You throw something up, it's going to fall down. We know that. Not today it's going to go up, and you know, maybe tomorrow will be a bad day, it'll go, it'll go up further. It doesn't work that way. There is a, con- a seeming consistency. The rules, law and order, but not always. Not always. I just saw recently, it's a wonderful book, which I would recommend by David Lieberman, uh, about the here of free will. And he gives it away for free, pretty much. It's interesting. A book about free will, and it's basically free. I think it costs like $3. Wonderful, wonderful book. And, um, you know, over there, he, he mentioned the idea, I quoted somebody, a physicist, who said that any phenomenon in physics can actually be reversed. Whatever's going on in nature, you can actually see the opposite. It can completely retract. It's either one way or the other. It was a big chiddush. Nothing is stoic, nothing static, nothing just stays the way it is. Constant movement of possibility. Okay. So, therefore, it's interesting to note that, according to the Meshach Chachma, anyway, you could understand why when Moshe is about to appear, to appear to power for the first time, minus the 70 elders, whose yichus do we mention? We explain where they come from in, she- in Shevet Levi, right? But we also mention the genealogy of two other tribes. Which tribes? Reuven and Shimon. We start, okay, Reuven and his children, Shimon and his children, Levi and his children, until we get to Moshe. What do I need Reuven and Shimon for? The answer is that was the leadership of the Jewish people. It wasn't going to come from anywhere else. It was going to be either Reuven, now that check off, that didn't work. Shimon, that didn't work. Levi got someone, okay, that was on strike, it was two strikes. Three strikes, you're out. But in Levi, there was a worthy strain of leadership, the Amuna of Amram, Amram, Miriam, Yocheved, that merited to bring forth uh, Moshiach Yisrael. Also, it, it represents that everybody, after that day, came together. When the Jewish people saw the first plague, and if they came out of Paro, Dustin and Aviram notwithstanding, and blamed Moshe, and then the next day they're off forever from working, right? They came around. They started to come around and congeal as a nation. And Ruve and Shimon and Levi and the rest of the Jewish people who were slaves became more on equal terms and became one again. Okay, so what do we see so far? There is a, and, and, and this is a hugely important theme in our Parsha era, and then we're going to go to the Abu Hatzerah. So you ready? Perfect. Hashem's Midos were taught to Moshe. Moshe says, Lama hari osa la'amazeh. Why did you do evil to this nation? Says the Racham HaKadosh, there is no evil from Hashem. Ra, like Eitz Adas Tov, Ra, may come as a 